good evening to all who joined us and thank you for joining us and uh, hope all of you are safe at home and uh, yeah so that's our beginning professor's uh, talk so i just uh, give a short introduction about our botanics chapter at iit bombay uh, so so the chapter formation took place in early September 2019 with the motto of bringing together uh, students and researchers interested in botanics and optics. And uh, we've been growing large since then. And yes, so we've also had uh, activities conducted regularly since then, uh, research seminars, ask me anything sessions where students get to closely interact with the guest speakers and ask them anything uh, ranging from their career path to the technical aspects. And, uh, yeah, so one of our main motives is to take optics and photonics to the high school students to encourage them to have a career in optics and photonics. And one such activity uh, was this, uh, where we demonstrated um, basic experiments in light uh, to the high school students in a school in Powai. And um, uh, photonics chapter at IIT was also a very active form hub. So as most of you might be knowing, form stands for the photonics online meetup. So it was the first of its time. And uh, so this happened in early January this year. And uh, our photonics chapter at IIT Bombay was a very active hub even at 5 a.m., which is a very uh, dark time difference. And um, so we had this light stage, which is an independently organized event by the photonics chapter at IIT Bombay. Uh, so light standing for light for innovation, thought, and education. At the inaugural session, we had our student speakers introducing different uh, aspects of um, career and um, the field in photonics. And yes, so coming to today's talk, um, uh, it's a continuation to mark uh, the International Day of Light, which was uh, celebrated this year on 16th May, as in every other year. And uh, so this year also marks the 60th uh, year of laser innovation. And uh, so as you might be knowing, Ideal is not just about laser, it's, it's about everything where light was present. And um, the photonic chapter at IIT Bombay uh, promotes the See the Light campaign, which is the motto of this year's idea. So we are also committed to taking photonics and optics for these four categories. So maybe better diagnostics and treatment, uh, which is very relevant to today's scenario, cleaner energy, sustainable farming, and high speed connectivity. Um, so to mark this idea, on May 16th, we had a webinar session by uh, two speakers, Professor Ajay Badak and Kaushik Tolji, which is widely on light and evolution of quantum theory. And uh, today we have Professor Zubin joining us to introduce our spin photonics to us. And um, so to give a short bio of what uh, Professor Zubin, so he's currently an associate professor of electrical and computer engineering at Purdue University. He completed his PhD from Purdue in 2010, his master's from Princeton, and his BTEC in electrical engineering from IIT Bombay. Zubin Jacob is a winner of DARPA, Director Fellowship, National Science Foundation Career Award in 2017, DARPA Young Faculty Award, and Purdue EC Outstanding Graduate Student Mentor Award. Uh, Professor Zubin Jacob, so it's a pleasure to host you here at the light stage. Now, over to you. Great. Um, I hope uh, everyone can hear me. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to give a talk. Um, it's uh, definitely a pleasure. I hope everybody is staying home and uh, staying safe. Um, things are uh, not easy anywhere around the world. And uh, sometimes uh, it's um, nice to escape into some um, uh, memories of uh, good times in IIT Bombay. Where, which is actually my alma mater, uh, where we started working. And actually, I started working on uh, optics photonics uh, in my third year in IIT Bombay. And I also did some research work in Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, uh, which is in Kolaba. Uh, and uh, that's how actually I started doing optics. This was uh, back in 2003 uh, and 2004. And I'm pretty much, this is 2020. And uh, I have been doing optics and photonics uh, um, almost forever now. So this has still been a lot of fun. Um, it's all exciting to learn new things. So um, I hope that the talk will uh, bring more people into the field and uh, maybe pique your curiosity about what's happening in uh, different research groups around the world. So uh, let me start by thanking the IIT Bombay chapter, um, the photonics chapter, and especially uh, Lakshmi for inviting me. And um, 
we will try to go through uh, some of the recent research work in my research group and uh, I'll be happy to take questions on any aspect that uh, you would like to know about. So before I start, I just want uh, a, a quick uh, feedback. Oops. Um, let me stop the share. Just want a quick feedback. Um, is everything, uh, was everything audible uh, as I spoke and uh, now I'm not sharing my screen? But I just want to confirm that uh, you were able to see my screen before. Yes, sir. It was all good. Okay. All right. Perfect. So I'll go back to that. Uh, now I'm sharing my screen again. And um, I'm actually going on full screen. And um, uh, please send me a chat or a message if something is going wrong. Sure. All right. So um, most of the research work that I'm going to present today uh, is available online. Um, we have the website, which is easy to remember, just electrodynamics.org. And um, my students uh, maintain the group and I hope uh, you will kind of go through some of the research. I'm just going to give you an overview uh, so that um, it's, it, it is short. So I'm going to talk about spin photonics, which is an emerging area of research with many groups around the world working on it. My research group is also working in this area. And it all connects with um, a very recent uh, development that um, the spin properties of light uh, ends up being beyond just our concept of polarization that we learn in the standard textbooks. And it can have a lot of uh, important applications going ahead. At the same time, there's some very fundamental aspects that remain to be explored. So what I'm going to do is give you a flavor of three areas of research where the photon spin takes a central stage. And the first one is quantum optics. What I mean by that is in the field of uh, light matter interaction, uh, you can have quantum emitters or quantum scattering events that probe uh, different properties of light, uh, even at the single photon level. And uh, this is a very, very large area of research and has close connections to uh, quantum computing uh, in the context of circuit QED. Now, the photon spin, very interestingly, uh, has not been um, explored in detail in this um, areas. And um, uh, that's one of the very emerging area. Uh, the other area that I want to talk about is topological materials. So this is really a field of condensed matter physics and material science. And it turns out that photonics can play a very important role here once you start analyzing the photon spin in detail. So I'll explain a little bit about topological materials. Then I want to talk about radiative heat flow. So heat, um, as we know it, um, is carried, uh, uh, I mean, the three approaches that you learn when you're studying heat is uh, conduction, convection, and radiation. So the radiation, which is really the heat carried by photons by thermal radiative fluctuations, they can actually also carry spin. And this is very interesting. And uh, it's really a multidisciplinary effort because radiative heat flow often is of interest mainly to mechanical engineers. Topological materials is of interest to condensed matter physics. Quantum optics is often found in um, electrical engineering departments as well as uh, physics departments. So, and topological materials is always definitely found in material science departments as well. So it's really uh, an interdisciplinary effort to try to understand all of these applications, but all connected by the common thread of uh, the spin of the photon. So very quickly, I think the most important uh, aspect is, of course, uh, uh, all the work that I'm presenting here is done by um, my students and postdocs. I'll be mentioning work by Todd Van Mechelen today, also uh, Chinmay Khandekar, uh, who's also an IIT Bombay alum. He's a postdoctoral scholar in my group, and he is working on the thermal aspects, uh, Dr. Li Ping Yang, uh, who is uh, working on the uh, relativistic field theory for photon spin, and um, many other students shown here uh, who have contributed to this work. These are some of my uh, ex-students uh, who have graduated and these are the funding agencies. Just a quick uh, shout out to some of those who are interested. We do have openings almost every year uh, for PhD students and postdoctoral scholars. All right, so let's get started. Um, now, one of the things uh, that is often kind of missing maybe in undergraduate and graduate curriculum is the fact that uh, there's not enough appreciation of the fact that there's actually a very, very fundamental intrinsic degree of freedom in every particle found in nature. 
Uh, you can go down to the basically subatomic uh, particles uh, to all the way to electrons and photons. I mean, there is a one fundamental intrinsic degree of freedom that classifies them, and that is a spin. So all particles in nature can be classified as bosons or fermions. And these bosons have integer spin, and the fermions have half integer spin. And this spin is an angular momentum, which is an intrinsic degree of freedom connected to aspects of the wave function and the symmetries of the wave function. So this is kind of an important dichotomy that um, is important to keep in mind while uh, working on anything that is of relevant uh, of relevance to your own um, kind of uh, research work, uh, especially at the microscopic level. We tend to kind of forget this aspect uh, quite often. So I thought I'd start with this. And as far as our photonics chapter is concerned, um, the most important elementary particles are just photons and electrons. Photons are spin one, that's the integer spin, that's why it's a boson. And then you have electrons which are spin half, fermions. Um, and every other kind of quasi-particle that you can think of, like an exciton, a plasmon, uh, and other quasi-particles, they can basically be built from these photons and electrons, which are the most elementary particles. And the theory governing these elementary particles and their interaction is quantum electrodynamics. So um, the important point is that there is a lot of fundamental aspects of spin, which are only manifested when you start looking at both a quantum and a relativistic theory. Now, we can definitely go back to some of the early experiments and ask the question, I mean, how did we know that the photon has spin? One is just theoretically, we can uh, kind of find the right symmetries to find the, the photon has spin, but all of the theory came later. The experiments, actually the seminal experiments, um, were actually for the case of light, and for the rest of my talk, I'm gonna focus completely on light and, and photons. The seminal experiments, um, two of them, and one thing maybe uh, you will find interesting is that uh, the second experiment that I chose as one of the early experiments is actually by C.V. Raman. And this is the time when uh, uh, is uh, actually in, in Bangalore. So um, the f one of the kind of most famous and convincing experiments is that of Beth. Uh, and what Beth did was he took a, a birefringent, that's an anisotropic uniaxial plate. He shined a plane wave with spin or a polarization uh, on it, and uh, what he was able to prove is that there's a torque exerted on this physical plate. And that torque uh, is definitely coming because these photons are scattered from the birefringent plate going from left-handed circular polarization to right-handed circular polarization. And he was able to measure this, a very sensitive and difficult experiment, and he was able to measure that and clearly shows that light is carrying spin angular momentum. But still there are important questions. I mean, what about the photon in free space? Does it consist of just linearly polarized or are there more aspects to this? And what C.V. Raman's experiment, which studied light scattering from gases was kind of able to prove is that the free space photon should be thought of as a left circularly polarized photon and a right circularly polarized photon in superimposed together. Um, and that is what creates your uh, linear polarization. So the spin, uh, was also shown in, in this paper, and of course, many other papers uh, subsequently, and also kind of atomic selection rules and so forth. So this, this thing right here is a photonic spin torque, and that was one of the early experiments. So following these experiments, we all realized that the photon carries spin, but recently, something very interesting has happened, and uh, our understanding has changed considerably. And going from these early experiments, which were really probing global spin properties related to polarization, where you are talking about an angular momentum transfer. So you talk about conservation laws in a global sense and in a macroscopic sense, this was very well understood. But what is happening more recently is that many researchers uh, around the world are figuring out that there's actually an angular momentum flow occurring at a microscopic level and there's a local conservation law at a microscopic level that con relates to the spin angular momentum of light. So this property is a local spin property 
So think about a global spin, which is well known as your polarization, but a local spin property is a density of the spin. And this is essentially a spin density. So this spin density can be controlled in devices, specifically in nanoscale devices, and specifically in um, nanoscale engineered materials. This property starts taking center stage, which uh, is new and interesting uh, from many different points of view. So one of the important points of view that we have recently kind of uh, unraveled in this paper uh, is the concept that if you really want to talk about spin of the photon from a quantum theory, then it's not enough to quantize the light uh, in a cavity. It's not enough to think about Maxwell's equations as we know, but it's actually necessary to think about the Dirac Maxwell fields together. And this is a, a relativistic field theory becomes necessary to think about the spin operator. And if you want to talk about a quantum spin operator, then you read, need quantum relativistic field theory. So, um, which is essentially for the case of electrons and photons is essentially Q quantum electrodynamics. So uh, starting from the QED approach, we were able to derive the spin operator for the photon, which is probably of a lot of interest to the theory oriented students in the audience. What I would like to do is uh, give you a broad flavor of more of the experimental consequences and experimental observables that are connected to such spin density and spin operator. So some very nice experiments uh, in multiple different fields of research have shown that if you have cold atoms or quantum emitters, which are very, very tiny objects near nanoscale um, uh, uh, photonic devices, in this case, is just a very thin optical fiber your um, light from the cold atoms can actually go preferentially in one, one direction. That's very nice and elegant work from uh, Arno Rauschenbottle's group. And uh, this is essentially what you would study as an HE11 mode for a cold atom, well, for an optical fiber, and that's what the atom is coupling to. Other experiments have, say, uh, nanostructured surfaces, um, metasurfaces, where you shine the light, left and right circularly polarized light, have a different linear momentum. You can see in this image that there's a right circularly polarized light. It only goes in this direction to the right hand side. And this is a left circularly polarized light. It only goes to the left in that direction. So there's a clear connection between this polarization and momentum. And this is coming again from the local spin density properties uh, as opposed to just global polarization alone. This is another experiment. Uh, which is connected to uh, what is known as a metamaterial. A metamaterial is an artificially textured material to start getting properties that probably don't exist easily in nature. And in such a material, uh, once again, if you have a antenna, which is circularly polarized, the energy goes only in the left, but the energy does not go in the right. Now, the fundamental origin of all these phenomena, the universal way of thinking about this in, is in terms of the spin density and the evanescent wave. So uh, here uh, is the right uh, way to think about this effect is if you look at simply the classical electromagnetic field of evanescent waves, which are kind of ubiquitously present in different devices, starting from the case of waveguides, which work based on total internal reflection based on optical fibers, also based on total internal reflection, or surface waves on a metal and air interface. These are called surface plasma and polaritons. If you look at any of these different devices, um, you always will encounter evanescent waves. And this is essentially analysis beyond the paraxial approximation, analysis including a vector field theory. And if you analyze this, what you end up seeing is that there is a new electromagnetic triplet that corresponds to linear momentum, corresponds to the decay of the evanescent wave, and you just take a kind of right-hand rule and you take a, a cross product between the momentum and the decay and the spin density always points in that direction. So this interesting consequence um, was actually uh, surprisingly not noticed. And uh, this is what is known as the locking between the spin density and the momentum which implies that if you have these type of evanescent waves in your structures, your spin is going to be locked to the momentum. And this is the kind of 
right hand rule this is the equation where it comes from and this occurs in the optical fiber please note again the optical fiber mode is going in this direction this is the momentum uh, this is the decay direction for the evanescent wave and this is the locking between the spin and the momentum so the spin always points in this direction out of the plane and can be understood by a right hand rule and you can also kind of probe further and ask why not a left hand rule and you will see that a decay which is a direction set by the passive nature of the medium there's only a decay this cannot be a growth it immediately sets that you will only have this right hand rule and uh, these are also of course the classical fields the spin one vector fields are also valid for single photon in these modes so unlike the previous paper that i mentioned where really trying to understand commutation relationships and noise requires a quantum field approach here um, you can solve this yourself using standard maxwell's equations and get this insight and this is actually really very important so again uh, this these details are explained in this paper in a lot of detail uh, and um, uh, there are also other works which are very interesting in this field and again uh, if you are for example working with optical waveguides uh, if you look carefully uh, you will see that this is a universal property and even in optical waveguides you're going to see this sort of a spin density in the near field that is locked to the momentum direction so think about this as kind of local rotations of the electric field and local rotations of the magnetic field but the rotation has a handedness that is set by the momentum and i think the um, um another very nice example and i'll show you some simulations that will make it even more clearer uh, is the case of say a cold atom or um, uh, a quantum dot uh, which is emitting light in uh, into the spherical resonator which is bouncing photons around uh, inside the resonator so this is your circularly polarized um, um, single photon coming out uh, and something very interesting happens when you look at the spherical mode so this is a simulation i hope it's uh, clear and it's hope it's playing on your screen as well and you can clearly see that the orbital angular momentum of the whispering gallery mode is coupled to the local spin density and the local spin polarization at the location of the source and at the location of the source it occurs because you have a zeeman transition with a very specific selection rules and if you have a plus one transition where the magnetic quantum number changes by plus one you have an orbital angular momentum in this direction but if you have the other case you will have it going in the other direction so this is a uh, kind of a very important um, consequence of this uh, spin density and it only occurs in the near field so we are working with experimentalists to actually verify this um, idea we have many experiments in the works uh, i'm going to mainly talk be talking about theory in my talk today the other thing which uh, i will briefly mention is that uh, you can see many of these effects uh, even when you solve the dirac equation for fermions and this is another way of really proving that you're talking about a spin density and not an orbital angular momentum density is by having direct comparisons to the optical fiber and in this example i mean this is a dirac wire it's a fermionic dual of an optical fiber where you have some internal mass for the electron and another mass outside so this is in a way confining confining the electrons to a wire and instead of solving the schrodinger equation like you do in a quantum well what we do here because spin is a relativistic quantity what we do here is solve the dirac equation for such a um, system and we call this the dirac wire and you can see some very interesting properties of spin density uh, arising and the total spin in this case you can see is half h bar which is a half integer so this is how you can really ascertain the concepts that you're talking about are related to spin density so let me move on uh, to the next topic here these are all connected to quantum optics let me move on to my next topic connected to spin photonics which is related to topological materials so um, one of the very important uh, developments in the field of uh, photonics and also condensed matter physics is that of trying to understand uh, new phases of matter and new uh, electromagnetic states that arise so um, when you have a bunch of scatterers which are organized very carefully uh, you can actually see uh, very unique states of light moving in one direction 
Uh, and this was uh, work inspired from uh, Duncan Haldane's early work in the field of photonic crystals and has been uh, extended, has become a whole field of research that I, I think that uh, is very nice for you to go and uh, look into. Um, I'm going to focus a bit more on what are the consequences for material science? What are the consequences for atomic crystals when you start looking at photon spin uh, in sort of a um, two-dimensional material, such as graphene, molybdenum disulfide, and so forth. So I'm changing gears from photonic devices, optical fibers, and uh, kind of surface plasma and polaritons. I'm changing gears to material science and looking at really atomic structures and trying to ask, what is the photon spin going to give rise to in this uh, completely new scenario? So what we found is very interesting is that uh, very specifically for the case of graphene, which is a two-dimensional material with a hexagonal lattice arrangement of carbon atoms. When you take graphene and you add a very special uh, property to graphene known, known as Hall viscosity, this is related to an applied magnetic field and the Hall effect at very low temperatures. In that case, the photon spin plays a very important role and you end up seeing some new effects that I'll show you uh, some simulations for. Um, and this is closely connected to the other phases in graphene, which are well known, which is known as a churn insulator phase, where you have graphene with second nearest neighbor hopping and that causes electronic states to go only in one direction on the edge. And there's also uh, another state known as the quantum spin hall insulator, where uh, there is graphene with spin orbit coupling, and you have positive spin states going in one direction and down spin states going in the other direction. This case that I'm mentioning is very different. It consists of graphene with hall viscosity. And what really happens is that you have photonic spin waves, photonic edge states with integer quantized spin going on the edge in one direction. And this is an entirely new phase of matter with a different classification than what is known as a churn insulator and a quantum spin hall insulator. So uh, I think the easiest and best way to often understand these uh, systems and models and materials is to look at um, a kind of the entire solution and study all the simulations. And here, what I'm trying to show you is a model for graphene with hall viscosity. And you can clearly see that when you excite this graphene with Hall viscosity, you have a very unique edge wave, which is a spin one photonic edge wave that only moves in one direction. And it actually traverses this obstacle without any back reflections whatsoever. And this can be used to build a very small topological circulator. Uh, with size which is uh, kind of 100 times smaller than the wavelength. And this is uh, kind of explained in this paper in more detail. And what you essentially do is that you have a viscous Hall fluid. Uh, this is, uh, think of it as an electron fluid, which is described by a topological Navier-Stokes equations, and you couple it with Maxwellian electrodynamics, and you look at these solutions. Now, uh, the other very important thing that I want to mention is that when you look at this theory more carefully, something very beautiful arises, is that photons in vacuum actually have no mass, as we all know. But when photons are coupled to this topological Navier-Stokes uh, fluid, the viscous Hall fluid, uh, there's a interesting Chern-Simmons photon mass that develops um, inside this uh, Hall fluid. And these are kind of subtle details which are explained in this uh, archive paper, uh, which I hope you will go and read. So what are the experimental consequences uh, is that you are going to get a uh, energy dispersion, energy momentum dispersion, which has a gap in this graphene plus Hall viscosity. There will be a gap and inside the gap, there'll be a topologically protected edge state that only goes in one direction. So uh, this is actually a photonic edge state and this is really very important um, experimental consequence of what is happening. And, um, let me kind of go ahead and show you another important excitation inside this graphene plus Hall viscosity. There's another very important excitation, which is a spin one photonic skirmion. So when you think about an excitation inside uh, a cavity, what you always have is a photon. 
that's the excitation in that, inside the cavity. When you talk about an excitation uh, inside matter, you can kind of talk about what is known as a polariton. That is an excitation that has some light part and some matter uh, part. Then, you, for example, you can have a phonon polariton, which is a little bit of light coupled with an optical phonon. And uh, there are all these classes of excitations. Um, but the skirmion uh, is fundamentally unique and different and has uh, not been kind of really isolated inside condensed matter yet. This is a spin one photonic skirmion. A magnetic skirmion is very, very routinely um, isolated, but not a photonic one. And the photonic one is very different because it actually connects with a large energy range and a large momentum range excitation. So it's not a localist, localized quasi-particle in energy and momentum space. So it is definitely an excitation that is really delocalized in energy and momentum. And the only signature of such a skirmion is once again trying to really understand some sort of a magnetic field due to photon spin are coming in inside this graphene plus viscous Hall fluid. So we have also proposed experiments to understand this. Uh, and the most beautiful aspect of this is that you have a Dirac Hamiltonian, which ca um, captures a skirmion. And you can also have a Maxwell Hamiltonian, which very intrig intriguingly captures the um, skirmion. And th this is essentially, say, a conventional medium. If you start probing what happens to the photonic magnetic fields inside, uh, they are all pointed in the same direction and there's no skirmion here. But when you look at this type of a graphene with Hall viscosity, which is a interesting medium, you will see that the vectors show a tumbling behavior. And this tumbling behavior is essentially characteristic of a skirmion. So that brings me kind of to the end of the topological materials. Uh, both of these things, have, uh, we are working on multiple experiments. Let me uh, share a few more slides about how photon spin is taking a central role in the field of uh, radiative heat as well, which is an entirely different area uh, of interest to suppose solar cell researchers, radiative cooling researchers. Um, this is um, something very interesting and we can consider a very canonical example of a slab of material and you heat this slab of material and you will see that there's a lot of charge and polarization fluctuations in here and that's where your heat radiation comes from. And when you look at the heat radiation, normally you only think about heat radiation and heat energy. So think about this, there is heat energy in the form of radiation coming from the sun to your hand and what you really feel when you I say that your heart is essentially your photons are falling on your skin and transferring that radiative heat energy from the sun to your body. That's how you feel hot. But it's not just heat energy uh, that is flowing in the radiation. There's actually spin flowing in the radiation as well, like the early concept I mentioned of the spin density flowing in heat radiation. And we considered this a very special case of a uh, of um, material with a magnetic field applied to it. The magnetic field kind of breaks the symmetry so that you have a net spin density and a net spin torque coming solely from heat. So think about Beth's early experiment where Beth showed that you shine a light beam on a um, plate and the plate would rotate. I mean, here you're really talking about uh, heat um, and thermal equilibrium causing a small torque in an extremely small microscopic particle that does not perturb your global equilibrium considerably. And that's uh, kind of shown in this figure where you have, say, this type of a, a indium antimonide um, slab with an applied magnetic field. This is how the magnetic field is applied. And you look at um, some small particles performing Brownian motion inside the fluid. And you should see this very interesting uh, kind of energy flow and spin torque uh, on these small particles, uh, which is also an experiment that we are currently performing. And this is the simulations of the spin angular momentum density flowing in this field. And this is all in the near field. It's actually very close to the object. But you can also consider cases where the thermal radiation very far from the object is also spinning. And to configure that, what you can do is that you have a hot nano antenna and a cold nano antenna placed very close to each other. 
A nano antenna is essentially a polarizable object, which is really small. And uh, if you have this hot and cold objects very close to each other, we showed that the light in the upper hemisphere is going to be right circularly polarized light and the, right, the light in the lower hemisphere is going to be left circularly polarized. This is all coming from the coupling between the two antennas. So, and if you flip the hot and cold, it's a non-equilibrium condition, your LCP and RCP is going to flip. And this is a very interesting uh, effect. Once again, this is the spin density which is plotted versus wavelength. This is in the infrared range. And in the infrared range, um, you can get this sort of a spin density uh, in spinning thermal radiation, which is could be very important for uh, infrared LEDs and other applications. So uh, this brings me to the end of my talk. I try to give you a lot of fundamental flavor in this talk uh, because applications are something uh, that will come about as we work on this um, slowly. And I thought that uh, this would be of interest to a very broad audience. And this, just to summarize, I was speaking mainly about this emerging field of spin photonics, where the spin of the photon is taking a very central role. It has important applications in quantum optics, topological materials, as well as radiative heat flow. And this is uh, um, the website where you can find a, a lot more details. So with that, uh, let me thank the audience uh, for the time. And uh, I will be very happy to answer questions. Hi, Professor Suvin. Uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, so we, we enjoyed your talk in this field of photonics. So especially how the window of photonics playing a central role in uh, quantum optics and uh, topological inflectors as well as radiative flow, heat flow. So uh, now it's the time to question and answer. So any of the audience have any questions, uh, you can post your questions in this Q&A chat box. And I will read the question for you, sir, and you can answer it. Great. Yeah, so I can actually see it yeah, in the Q&A section, yes. Okay, sir. Uh, actually, I can see the questions. I can probably read it out myself also. Okay, sir. Okay. Then you can continue, sir. All right, great. So uh, this is uh, from uh, Dr. Kumar. Dr. Can you explain the summary of a talk in a simple and easy way for participants who are not in the optics core field uh, and the applications of the talk in quantum topological and radiative fields? Sure. So um, let me try to explain it in, in, in two ways. Um, I'm going to kind of try to explain it uh, first from um, a fundamental point of view, and then I'll try to give you an applied point of view. So the fundamental point is the following. I mean, we have light. I mean, this is ubiquitous uh, in a lot of different technologies that are present. So what are the fundamental aspects of light that we understand? I mean, we know that light carries momentum. We know that light carries energy. We also know that light carries spin or polarization. And this is very well understood. However, uh, what is less understood is the fact that this polarization is really a global property. There is a local spin density. There's a local space and time dependent field associated with the spin that changes in space and time. And this is a, 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 a relativistic and quantum property. And this can be controlled in very unique ways when the photon spin interacts with electron spin or the photon spin interacts with um, magnetic fields inside matter. So this interaction is very unique and uh, is important for many applications. So an easy way to understand is think about rotation, mechanical rotation, that's an angular momentum, but that's really a gro global property. An intrinsic property of the photon is actually a sort of local rotation at every point in space and time. And this is of fundamental interest for um, uh, applications as well as uh, uh, some very cool science. And in terms of um, topological materials, once again, I wanted to mention is that when you start thinking about this local rotation inside matter, then you start seeing that matter can have a lot of new excitations, such as the spin waves on the edge of matter going in one direction, and the other was the skirmionic excitation. So these waves that go only in one direction can be very useful for making a circulator. So a circulator is a device that actually allows electromagnetic energy to go in one direction, but 
does not allow energy to go in another direction. This is a three port device. In a two port device, you think of it as an isolator. The circulator is actually very useful device used very widely in uh, uh, antennas uh, and um, radio wave communication systems. In fact, even in quantum computing systems, uh, making a small circulator is a very important problem because you want to send signals in one direction, but you don't want signals coming back from um, your port of interest. So you want signals going in one direction. These type of spin waves that I mentioned actually only go in one direction. And furthermore, um, normal circulators are very bulky because of the magnets that you use and because of the interference that is needed. These type of circulators can be made a hundred times smaller than existing circulators. So that's what the applications of a lot of interest. And in terms of heat radiation, we are exploring uh, how heat can also carry this spin angular momentum and could be used in some sort of energy conversion devices. So I hope that gives you kind of a broad overview of the fundamental as well as applied aspects of this talk. And um, so now I'll move on to the next question. Uh, this is from Anshuman Kumar. And this is actually a very, very uh, brilliant question actually. So um, Anshuman Kumar says that the usually Maxwell Chern Simmons theory uh, um, is not topological. And it's actually not topological from the point of view of the photon or not topological from the point of view of the electromagnetic field. Are you breaking any invariance in your model uh, to get a topological theory out of it? And the answer is yes. It's a very good question. And uh, this is um, kind of what we meant by Hall viscosity. So it's not just a Hall conductivity, it's a Hall viscosity. And uh, this definitely breaks, uh, as you would expect, uh, kind of time rever reversal symmetry, but also the parity symmetry in this fluid is broken. So P and T symmetry broken fluid uh, is actually going to, for, from the electromagnetic field point of view, uh, is going to give you uh, this topological theory, which we call viscous maxwell chern simmons theory. So it's a modification to the conventional chern simmons theory to get this new topological phase of matter. Um, and this is very interesting and it's a very good question. Great, so now the next question is from Swati Bansal. And the question is kind of a broad question. Can we implement waveguide equations and spin densities in Python? And the answer is absolutely yes. So um, we don't have all the code available, but we can make it available uh, to you uh, on request. Uh, if you send me an email, uh, much of the code for the spin density for the whispering gallery mode simulations that you saw, the also the um, spin momentum locking simulations that you saw, uh, these can all be implemented in Python and the spin densities can be uh, studied from a very fundamental point of view. And I'm happy to make this code available to anybody uh, on request. Um, so I will go to the next question and this is from uh, Sharmila. Um, you mentioned photon gaining mass. Uh, does this introduce a spin zero? Uh, okay, great. So, I mean, these are all really very nice questions. Um, and uh, the answer is that uh, in this case, uh, we do have a longitudinal uh, mode which is present inside matter. And this does uh, introduce a spin zero uh, type of longitudinal mode. But um, there are very fundamental differences in three dimensions and two dimensions. And um, the massless photons, definitely they only have helicity. That really means that if you have a photon traveling in free space, um, the direction of the spin is along the wave vector. So it does have a photon spin, but it is actually a, a measurable is essentially the helicity, which is along the direction of the wave vector. In the case of the 2D material, once light is coupled to matter, uh, you actually have these uh, additional degrees of freedom, such as the spin zero photon as well. Yeah, that's a very good question. So can you please tell us the engineering research going on in photonics? All right, so this is a question from Neha. And um, so let me um, give you a broad perspective of uh, the engineering research related to uh, spin photonics. So one of them is really building a, a interface between electron spin and photon spin. So you have a lot of spin based electronic devices, uh, which are mainly in memories, uh, as well as some logic devices. And now, because of the properties of the photon spin, you can start thinking of these interfaces, both at the classical device level and the quantum device level. Um, these interfaces are very important. So uh, spin photonic interfaces. The other thing is, as I mentioned, the circulator. 
which is a one-way spin edge wave, which gives rise to um, a, a circulator behavior. So that's another application. Um, the third and the circulator will exist both in the classical and quantum domain. So almost everything that I'm mentioning, you should think of it from both the domains. And the third, the energy applications is essentially in the case of photon spin is circularly polarized infrared LEDs. These are actually very important. We have visible LEDs. Um, more recently, only recently have people learned how to make circularly polarized LEDs in the visible. You can actually start thinking of infrared circularly polarized LEDs uh, that could come from these thermal uh, excitations and this thermal engineering. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Okay, so uh, I have to, uh, does spin cause additional energy into the atom? And the question is from Abhishek Kumar. Um, so the thing is, uh, the, the question is, uh, there's no additional energy, but there's energy splitting that is connected to applied magnetic fields and uh, photon spins. So there's an energy splitting um, that breaks the degeneracy of two levels that might be at the same, um, uh, first might be two levels of the same energy, but then you apply a magnetic field and there's a splitting. And this is closely connected to uh, how the electron spin interacts with the magnetic field and also how the photon spin interacts with this two level system. So the next question is also from Abhishek Kumar. Is there a difference in energy? Yes, again, the, there's no uh, difference in energy. The energy difference is essentially coming from the mass difference when you talk about say electrons and photons. Um, and uh, one really has to think about spin as a completely different degree of freedom than energy. So that's very important. So I hope that makes it clear that energy, there's momentum, there is spin, uh, angular momentum, and there's orbital angular momentum. So these are different quantum numbers that define light or define electrons. And you require all of them to explain uh, different phenomena. So the question from uh, Himangi is, how can spin photonics be useful in photonic computers? So this is a very good question. And this is, I would say, uh, in some ways, an open question. Um, and one of the important uh, avenues of research is that uh, once you have this uh, additional degree of freedom of helicity uh, or, or spin zero photons present in matter, you have plus one, minus one, and zero photons. So these could be used for um, not just qubit systems, but um, what is known as the qdit systems, which is a d-dimensional qubit, which is a higher dimensional, three-dimensional qubit. So in photonic computers, there are possibilities of using this higher degree of freedom of spin as a one additional kind of um, qdit system instead of a qubit system. And d is equal to three in this case. So uh, the next question is from Anshuman Kumar. What kind of temperatures are needed to observe photonics fermions? Uh, okay, this is a good question. Uh, the type of temperatures needed are actually very low temperatures. Um, uh, this is because just keeping these uh, in, in graphene with Hall viscosity, we would like to keep the losses low, uh, both optical losses as, as well as electron phonon scattering. And uh, the length scale, we are still working on this. Um, we expect it to be roughly between the 10 to 100 nanometer scales uh, in terms of the, the localization lengths once you apply the magnetic fields. But this can also be controlled based on the applied magnetic field as well as the Hall viscosity. So that's roughly the length scales of the modes that you see, and especially the length scales in the simulations as well. So then there's a question from Neha uh, about how would you connect photonics to uh, AI or ML? So um, this is a very good question, uh, and uh, there's a big um, research effort happening in trying to understand uh, AI and photonics. Uh, one of them uh, is closely related to, again, photon spin. So what happens is that uh, if you have many, many different materials uh, available to you, you actually want to characterize them based on the minimal number of measurements that you make to try to understand which ones have better spin photonic properties and which ones don't have which ones are non-reciprocal, which ones can be used for making a circulator, which ones are gyrotropic, which ones are gyromagnetic. So when you start trying to answer all these questions, you realize it's a very interesting classification problem. So AI, or rather I should say ML and deep learning uh, is very good as a classification for, I mean, it's exceptionally good for classification problems. Uh, not so much for discovery uh, types of problems where many things are 
uh, unknown. But for classification problems, uh, the ML is a great uh, option. And we are trying to look at classifying different types of materials, different types of spin photonic materials using machine learning. And uh, I hope that answers uh, your questions. Um, and there's one more question from uh, Ritu, and it's connected to, um, I mean, I guess the differences between free particles and bound particles. Um, so the idea is that when you have a free photon in uh, photon in free space, there's just a photon in free space, the spin is necessarily plus one or minus one, and the spin vector is always pointed along the direction of the wave vector, direction of the momentum. Uh, and that projection is known as helicity. Once you actually confine this photon, um, because of the three-dimensional nature of the vector fields, uh, new components arise uh, and you require to define spin density and other ideas. So the free particle always think of it as a free space photon in one frequency and one momentum mode, which can only have one spin vector. But the degrees of freedom increase a lot once you don't have a free particle. And that's what most of the talk I hope was able to convey. Uh, okay, so we can uh, end this question answer session if uh, there is no other more question. So if you people have more questions, you can uh, type it here. We will compile it and send to Professor Subin Shekhar. So uh, I will thank Professor Subin Shekhar once again for uh, his nice talk and uh, his interactive sessions, nice in, uh, answering of questions that audience asked. So thank you, Professor Subin Shekhar. On behalf of Photonics at IITB, uh, now uh, Kishore will end the session. Great. Thank you to all the students for all the questions. I'm getting some uh, messages. Yeah, thanks everyone. It was uh, definitely very nice to hear all your questions. Um, and I hope that uh, the talk was useful and has uh, kind of made you more curious to start uh, reading more about photonics. Okay, thanks, Professor, uh, for your time. So we are ending the session right now. So we have one more. Bye, sir. And we have one more section in next uh, Tuesday. It's by Professor Arka Majumda. So it's okay. on uh, okay. It's on June 9th from Excellent. 9 p.m. to 10 30. So hope you all of will again join the talk again. So it's on June 9th from 9 to 10 30. We will update the poster on our Facebook chapter and our website. So we are ending the session right now. Thank you Great. for all of your participation and hope your cooperation uh, in the coming talks. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. So Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye.